Welcome back to Faith Formation at Home. This week's gospel, we get the woman caught in adultery. Now, when you're dealing with kids, questions come up. How do you explain this to them in an age-appropriate way? You can essentially say that adultery is someone who is married pretending like they are married to someone else. Right? And that's what adultery is. And so the, these religious leaders bring this woman to Jesus who was, who was doing this uh, and say, well, what are we supposed to do with her? The law says we should, we should stone her, which means throws, throw rocks at her until she dies. Right? Um, and Jesus ultimately says this very famous line, right? Let the one among you who is without sin cast the first stone, right? We're, we're ready to condemn her to death for her sins. Well, what about you? Do you have any sins? Should we condemn you to death as well? That's kind of what Jesus is saying, right? It's this, this very provocative statement on Jesus's part. And one by one, these people drop their rocks and, and, and walk away. Um, a lot of interesting stuff going on in here, right? In our own households, how often are we ready to just kill our siblings or our family members, metaphorically, right? because of their sin, because of their wrongdoing, because of something they did that's driving us crazy. And we forget, I drive you crazy all the time. <laughs> and I do wrong things too. I'm not the perfect member of my household. We all mess up, all right? And so this is kind of a very practical application of Jesus's golden rule, right? Treat others the way you want to be treated or the measure with which you measure will be measured unto you is the way Jesus has worded it, right? If we expect, we demand often other people to be forgiving of us and understanding of our shortcomings, we must demand of ourselves to, to extend that mercy to them as well. Notice Jesus doesn't just let the woman off the hook, right? When everybody walks away and she's the only one that's left, he looks at her and he says, go, you know, lead, lead your life, but don't sin anymore. Don't keep doing the same things, All right? And so the same is true for us. Um, we need to not be willing to throw stones at our own family members, our own friends, our people, people around us without taking a deep look at ourselves. And we also need to go and sin no more. Our Bible story for our little ones from the Jesus Storybook Bible is the Servant King. We're going to start on that the long story of Holy Week um, because it's a long story, right? It covers a lot of stories in this Bible. And so this is actually the story of Holy Thursday. We kind of skipped over Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday this year, next weekend, we're going to take a look at Good Friday so that we can hit Easter Sunday on Easter Sunday. So this week, we're looking at Holy Thursday, the Last Supper, right? Jesus' last dinner with his apostles before he's arrested, tortured, crucified, and rises from the dead. So the Servant King, this story focuses on Jesus' act of service during the meal, right? He does this very bizarre thing in the middle of the meal. He gets, gets up, takes off his outer clothing, so he's basically got some undergarments on, wraps a towel around his waist and goes around to all of his disciples and washes their feet, which is weird for us. It's disgusting in Jesus' day because they walked around in sandals on streets where animals went to the bathroom. So their feet are just covered in nastiness. And Jesus washes his disciples' feet, right? A very interesting act of service. And he tells them he wants them to serve other people in a similar way, right? Do good for other people even if it's gross, even if it's disgusting, even if you're uncomfortable, do good to other people, right? And then at the end of this meal, what does he do? Is he takes bread and he takes wine and he transforms it into his own body and blood and he gives it to them. Why does he do this? Because we are what we eat, right? If you eat good and healthy food, you'll be good and healthy. And if you eat junk food, you're going to feel like junk. So Jesus makes himself into food for us so that we can literally eat him. So he'll become part of us. And then we can go out and we can be Jesus' hands and feet in the world so that when we wash other people's feet, whatever that looks like, you help your sibling clean up their room, you do your chores without your parents telling you to, uh, you know, whatever it might be, you can be Jesus in the world. That's an awesome thing. And that's the challenge of this, this Last Supper is, is find concrete ways to do good for other people, even if it's uncomfortable, even if you don't like it. Our catechism questions for older kids. We're continuing through the prayer section in this catechism, the green section. We've got a couple of examples of prayers before meals. We've got a couple of examples of some quick prayers and prayers in the evening, right? And these these Two, two sections here, prayers before meals and prayers in the evening. Talk about these as a family. There is a growing mountain of research that shows the single best thing you could possibly do for your family is to be a religiously involved household. And one of those key pillars is regular family prayer. So the easiest places to do that are shared meals and right before bedtime. And so these give you some suggestions of what that prayer might look like. Uh, and this is going to pay massive dividends in your family. So it is well worth thinking about how do we, how do we make this part of our family if it isn't? And if it is, how do we make sure that we keep doing it, keep it fresh, keep it exciting, keep it something new to it, right? And the last question in here, number 149, deals with the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer, right? This is an interesting prayer because it's the only time that Jesus gives us 
a, a set prayer, a rote prayer, a memorized prayer that he tells us to pray. And he gives us this Our Father prayer. It's got seven petitions in it. We refer to God as our Father because he doesn't want us to, to approach God as this, this terrifying being to be kept at arm's length. No, he's our daddy, right? He's our Father. He's our, our loving Father. So we're supposed to approach God as Father. We ask that his name be hallowed. Hallowed is a weird word we don't use anymore. It means to make his name holy. We want to make God's name be holy throughout the world. We want respect for God. We want to respect God ourselves, and we want others to respect him as well. May his kingdom come. When God's kingdom comes is when God does awesome things in the world. He parts the Red Sea. He tears down the walls of Jericho. Right? Jesus, at various points through his ministry, says, if you're seeing the signs that I'm doing and you're wondering what's happening, it's because the kingdom of God has come. So when we pray, may your kingdom come, we're praying like, Lord, be active in the world. Let me see it, right? So your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We want the resources to be able to do God's will. So we want to know what God's will is, and we want to be able to do it. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread is kind of an oddly worded petition. Give us this day our daily bread. It's repetitive. It's redundant. What's going on there? On the surface of it, we're asking for what we need for today. Right, our daily bread, our, our daily material needs, and our daily spiritual needs. But on a deeper level, what's going on in there, that second word, daily, daily bread, uh, I don't know why English translators mess this up. It's very clear in Greek. It says, it's, give us this day our supernatural bread, our super substantial bread. Right? Give us the stuff that we need supernaturally. So it's really a petition about our spiritual needs. And the ultimate supernatural bread is the Eucharist, Jesus' body and blood, soul and divinity. Right? So give us this day our Eucharist, our spiritual needs. And then comes the most dangerous petition in here. Forgive us our trespasses in the same way that we forgive those who trespass against us. All right, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We're essentially saying, Lord, you can forgive me to the extent that I forgive other people. So if I don't forgive other people in my life, I'm telling God, you've got my permission to hold my sins against me. You don't have to forgive me because I don't forgive other people. But if I do forgive other people, I'm saying, Lord, I would like you to forgive me the same way I forgive other people. I forgive all their wrongs. Could you please forgive mine? It's a very dangerous petition because often we don't forgive others well. Right? So forgive us the same way we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation. It seems like an odd petition. Why would we ask God not to lead us into temptation? God doesn't do that. It might be more accurately worded as don't let us fall into temptation. Right? Protect us from future sins. Right, from the, the temptations in the moment that are going to lead us to future sin. And then deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil one, right? from Satan, from the one who tempts us. So those last three petitions are really petitions for free us from our past sins, forgive our trespasses, free us from our present sins, the temptation to commit sins, and free us from future sins, the evil one who's going to tempt us to sin. You could also look at the Our Father as the first three petitions deal with God and the last four deal with us. Right? So Jesus gives us a nice template for how to pray with this Our Father prayer. Uh, and early Christians emphasize you should pray this prayer three times a day, morning, midday, day, and evening. So that might not be a bad Lenten practice for us here as Lent draws to a close, as we try to pray the Our Father and really focus on those words a couple of times each day.